and welcome to the latest episode of Off The Fence, brought to you in association with Boyle Sports. This is, of course, your weekly go-to digital jump show leading up to the Cheltenham Festival and beyond. And my God, we only have a couple more episodes to go before the big week in March. The year is flying by far too fast for my liking. Before we go any further, please do hit subscribe on our YouTube page so that you don't miss a single episode of Off The Fence between now and the Cheltenham Festival, where we will be covering the four days in March in great depth, as I'm sure you can imagine. Um, as always, I am joined by Barry Geraghty and Tony Keenan. Let's check in with the boys. Barry, how are you? Very good, Vanessa. Thank you. Yep. Yeah, uh, good weekend's racing and uh, no, all very good. Thank you. Good, good. And Tony, all good with you? Any trips racing this weekend? No, all very quiet uh, this week. And thanks to everyone who sent in questions there just this evening for the show. We, were, we realized we were possibly a little bit thin on stuff to analyze. We've got loads of excellent questions there, uh, some really uh, thought provoking ones. We'll try and answer as many as we can. Yeah, absolutely. As, as Tony says, we will be doing that towards the back end of the show. But thank you all for sending in your questions. Uh, there were some really interesting ones. So we will be tackling them in due course. But before we go any further, we do the what happened where section where we look back at the weekend's action. And of course, on Saturday, the big grade one was the Ascot Chase. And we got to see Shishkin back in action, Barry. Uh, absolutely brilliant. And he's jumped to the top of the Ryanair market. He's currently five to four with Boyle Sports for the Ryanair off the back of this win where he beat Pick Dory and Fakir Duderi's just beat them a distance essentially you were so keen on him beforehand and um, your confidence played out on the track yeah it was a great performance and um, from word go he jumped he traveled he, he just he was in his comfort zone and that's what he wasn't in the tingle creek and he probably didn't jump as you know as, as well as he should have that day and um, he was under the pump a lot of the way in the tingle creek but on saturday in ascot traveled brilliantly jumped really well he was a winner everywhere and it was the class horse that he is so he was he's, he's back up to the level of form that for me he'd have won his champion chase at but just that he needs that little bit further now so obviously he's had a little bit of um work done on his wind to help him too and he was running with a tongue tie for the first time but no you'd have to be really impressed with him and i think he's, he's pretty solid for the for the ryanair Considering how, how he runs and his running style and the way in which he jumps, Barry, uh, there was some talk post-race about him going to the Gold Cup. I, I think that's a, about a million to one to happen, but would you ever have him down as a Gold Cup horse? You could, but he has the option of the Ryanair, obviously. Um, he could go the Gold Cup route. Uh, there's no reason to suggest he wouldn't. Um, his pedigree would say he would get the trip, um, but it would be a big step up from two mile to go on for the for the Gold Cup, three mile, two and a, and a half around Cheltenham. It was very hard to get, but um, the Ryanair is tailor-made from. Nicky mentioned afterwards, maybe go for the bowl and entry. You could see him being a possible King George horse next season, and maybe then a Gold Cup could be considered. But um, I would be with you, I'd say, for the minute we're, we're getting the impression it's more likely to be the Ryanair. Tony at five to four for the Ryanair. Would you have any interest in him at that price off the back of the Ascot run? And, and did the Ascot run surprise you in any way? It did surprise me. I, I didn't like him at all on Saturday. I, I, I don't hold too many strong opinions on, on the English racing because I, I don't really know the, the real nuances of the horses. But to me, he, he looked a horse with, with a problem at um, Sandown and obviously the Champion Chase run last season. But I'd have to say uh, just an excellent training performance from Nicky Henderson. Um, Got him very much back to his best. I would have said he was he was running into the the mid one seventies. I would have said here easily. Um, he was meeting a horse in Peak Dory, who had been top of his game three from three this season. Um, just looking at the sectional times on, on the ATR website, there, there was a real lift in the pace kind of from six four lungs out to two four lungs out, and at that point it was only Shishkin and Peak Dory that were able to travel it. But Shishkin then was able to maintain that over the last two forums and pull away from a horse that, that, that was an excellent for a visually brilliant performance um kind of backed up by times and backed up by, by form and so on as to the ray and error uh, the gold cup thing first of all i look it would be wonderful if he went for the gold cup but to be honest it was never really on my mind that, that, that he would be thinking of a gold cup after this based on the, the trainer who's there and he's also of course, coming off a couple of physical issues here whether it be the 
the bone issue or whether it be the, the breathing issue to me stepping up gradually in trip would make more sense maybe than going three miles but perhaps he will be too old for, for a gold cup next year as to the Ryanair well, I think Nicky Henderson has done the really difficult part of it in terms of getting him back and uh, people who are wondering about getting him back I think that were very realistic concerns beforehand because they don't come back too often horse like this it, it's the fact that it happens so rarely makes it such an achievement and now he also has a, it's not as difficult a task but it, it's still a difficult task he, he's got him back to his peak he now has to keep him there and the Ryanair is only 26 days away so there will be a slight chance of a you know race maybe coming too soon I don't think there's any doubt for how visually impressive he was on Saturday he still did have a hard race there's nothing in the Ryanair that can live with him um, on raw ability it's just whether he can reproduce that or he may not even need to just reproduce what he did ask on Saturday just to get close to that and, and he is the one to be put I suppose at the price on the day I'd probably try and back something against him but it wouldn't be a massively strong opinion OK, well, let's move on and stick with you, Tony, to Janadil winning the Red Mills Chase at the weekend, beating Horton Calor into second, and Capadano made his reappearance to fill in the places in third. Uh, what were your takeaways from the Red Mills, I suppose? Janadil has been price-boosted by Ball Sports to 8-1 to one for the Ryanair, general shorter price than that elsewhere. Um, I suppose you've already covered that market, but what were your takeaways from Goran? Um, very good return from Janadil. Um Probably not a bona fide grade one horse, and we've lots of evidence to suggest that, but it was an excellent return when he didn't seem to be expected to return in anything like this shape. The market was negative, and the trainer was quite negative beforehand. The people looking at him in the paddock said he was carrying a bit. So excellent run out of him. Um, definitely have a chance of making the shake-up in the Ryanair the weather he'd be able to beat a peak from Shishkin. I don't know, it's just whether Shishkin is going to be at that peak. I was disappointed with Houghton Kalur. Um, the race was a little bit of a messy in that it was slowly run and he seemed to get very keen in the middle part of the race. I thought Paul Townend got caught out a little bit maybe with Janadil. He, he'd uh, look uh, through his legs after he jumped four out and Rachel Blackmore was kind of scrubbing Janadil long and I don't think he, he, he was worried about him at all. Then he kind of come to two out and oh, says maybe there is something here. He, he just went for everything very quickly but I still think Hold on Kaleo with fitness on his side should have been able to pull away. It, it wasn't a terrible performance for him by any means but I don't think there's any evidence to really suggest he's going to be winning a Ryanair on that and especially with Shishkin the same ownership. I wouldn't even be expecting him to turn up there. The race for him might be something like the race at um, Fairy House on Irish Grand National Day. Kind of a grade two, flat two and a half miles speed emphasising. Um, might suit him. I thought Capadano, who we've had a number of questions in about, he, he ran very well um, with a view to going up and trip. Uh, Gore and two and a half miles would, would be very much on the sharp side for him. He jumped well in the main bar, a couple of mistakes in the straight. I do think the big plan with him is probably not going to be Cheltenham as much as it's Aintree and perhaps even more so Punchestown. Punchestown has been his place over the last two seasons and maybe the Punchestown Gold Cup is the race they're kind of thinking of. With Gallop and the Champs, Mullins team have always, I'm sure, viewed him as the, the more Cheltenham Gold Cup horse with his proven form at the track, which Capadano was disappointing there in the Brown Advisory last year. And the Grand National is there for him too. I, I know he's only seven, but he, he does seem to have bags of stamina. He stayed really well at Punchestown last year. So perfectly encouraging return from him too. Okay, um, Barry, over to you for the sort of the sort of same race. What, what sort of where would you expect Janadil's big spring target to be? Yeah, well, I suppose the only um, I would slight negative from Janadil, albeit it was a great performance. He wasn't really expected, as in they felt he would need the run. So that isn't the perfect prep for going to Ryanair. So Tony mentioned as a guy Shishkin, there's twenty six days, but I would imagine Shishkin will bounce out of his run an awful lot better than Janadil will bounce out of this having needed to run as much as he did so on the back of a break so that would be a slight negative for him but it was a good performance by the horse especially when he did need the run as regards Hotan Kalur to me he's always been a strong traveller who promised a lot I think Turles would have suited him he would have won in Turles had he stood up but you know it's, it's an easier track than Gorn on soft ground or Cheltenham for that matter so I think he's a horse who would be better suited by that race Tony mentioned it very because he, he likes to travel and he's a horse who probably just doesn't find as much under pressure. So um, I wouldn't find much fault in anything that happened. Only just he's a horse that promises more than he delivers, maybe. Um, Capadano, though, he ran a cracker. And probably, like as Tony mentions, Aintree could be options for him or, or punches him. But the National, as a seven-year-old, it might just come a little bit soon for him. But he, definitely a great show from him. OK, Tony, let's move on to Phil Dore at Goran in the Red Mills trial hurdle. Back over hurdles, having been seen a good few times chasing, but latterly things not having gone his way. And then he makes a winning return over hurdles. Um, what what next for him, do you think, for, for Phil Dore? 
Well, I'd say what next for him is to try and find him a race with soft ground. Um, I do think that's possibly been his Achilles heel as much as that Nova fence is, is that he's had the run at Leperstown a couple of times so the ground is quite quick and even at Navin when he won a debut the ground wouldn't have been typical Navin slow I think it was yielding maybe pushing for yielding to soft that day and this is quite a difficult race to analyse and it's possible the form could mean nothing I think they were four and a half, 4.7 seconds slower than the um, four year old maiden hurdle beforehand I think that's wow. just colossal colossal for a grade two or sorry grade three hurdle um, Sharge is running on ground that he's always kind of hated and has now started this um, threat of throwing in quite a bad mistake in his races. So, again, I don't know what he's achieved. I think his head carriage isn't pristine at the minute either. He wasn't great in the Madison um, the day he beat Zana here. Just thought he wasn't great that day. And he, he was kind of off for time after that. So, worries there's still an injury kind of lingering there. I thought the horse like shit best was the, the toward horse, Dr. Bravo. Um, in theory, he was well positioned off a very slow pace, but I actually think he's a big Larry sort. There's a bit of mighty potter about him, but he doesn't like being in front um, too long. I think he got to the front very early there and made quite a bad mistake too out. Um, but he was getting a lot of weight from two horses. You don't really know what kind of level they've run to. I do wonder if you might pitch up on a Supreme. Like Gordon Elliott does not have a lot of horses for that race at the moment. In fact, he may not have any horses for the races, um, the opener on Tuesday. A lot of the horses that would be entered, he's talking about handicaps for them. I suppose the one who would have the most solid form, or at least the highest level of form, is Irish Point. And he's talking about maybe keeping him for a entry and Fairy House and Punchestown and so on. So I do think Dr. Bravo in a strongly run Supreme, it, it would suit him a little bit better, but, but he'd obviously need to step up an awful lot. Okay, Tony, um, Barry, going back to to Phil Dor, um, he's a horse that I've been a big fan of and, and now, I mean, like listening to Tony's answer there, I, I don't know, will we even see him at Cheltenham, the Coral Cup being touted, but I mean, with, is that likely? Well, it suppose it depends on the handicapper does with him. Um, he was in here, I think it was at 147. He's potentially going to get £7 for this. Um, he was getting £4 off Sharjah um, and was, I think, about £11 wrong with him. So he's looking at maybe getting £7 plus, depending on what the English handicapper does. But for me, Sharjah on soft to heavy ground, he was very much opposable. Um, Tony mentioned when he beat Zana here on Leopardstown, that day the last hurdle was bypassed and they came out wide to bypass it on the old ground from earlier in the, over Christmas and that was the worst part of the ground and as soon as he hit it he did get that head carriage because he started to struggle so for me the same thing in Gorn he was he was definitely one to take on because soft to heavy ground aren't his conditions he was 19 lengths behind Honeysuckle two years ago at the Dublin Racing Festival on soft to heavy ground so he really wants a better to be at his best so I don't think we saw anything near Sharjah at his best Phil Dord did well to win but if you put another seven pound on him in a handicap, I think he might find it hard work. Okay, sticking with the hurdlers, Barry, and sticking with you, uh, coming over to the UK, I like to move it absolutely bolted up in the Kingwell hurdle and uh, it seemed to surprise connections in the process as much as many other people. Um, he's put himself in the champion hurdle mix. He's around about a 20 to one shot in the champion hurdle and about half that price, tens and below in the without Constitution Hill market. Um, obviously we're biased on this show, Team Constitution Hill, but in terms of this horse as a champion hurdler, could you see him bouncing back to something like a place definite in a champion hurdle in March? I think definitely. Uh, this is a great run, uh, beat Napper's Hill and, and First Street. Two very smart horses who would have been well suited by the track, um, lots of pace, good ground, but um, no, I like to move it. That was a really good performance. He clocked a good time as well. Um, He's done well at Cheltenham before. He he won the he won the the Great Wood Hurdle on his first run this season. He then flopped um on New Year's Day in the Rail Keel on soft ground over two and a half miles. So he's come back to form here again. I think he's definitely got a squeak. If you're looking to take on if Vauban is third in the betting, he's definitely I think at that level, and he could give Stateman a little bit to think about. Okay. Okay, positive nod. And sticking with you, Barracks, we just want to cover the Grand National Trial up at Haydock. Uh, it was won by Venetia's um, runner in Quick Wave. Sorry, mind blank there. But Cloudy Glen finished in third and made a good reappearance run. And a horse who's caught your eye for the National at around 40s. Yeah, quick way bounced back after disappointing the Chep still having been a good winner in Sandon before that. Uh, that was a good performance. But yeah, I thought Cloudy Glens were on a cracker. Um he dropped in in the 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 former Ladbrokes trophy, as it's known in Newbury, when he won it last season, crept travel he jumps brilliantly, but he made the running in uh in Haydock 
on soft ground and he looked like a horse who just ran out of puff. Um, I'd imagine ridden with more restraint, but the, the way he jumps, he's back down. I think he's only five pound above the mark where he won in Newbury and he's possible even to get another pound or two off. He wouldn't want to get much more off or he might make the cut for the national, but I thought he could be a real smart national contender, but I definitely want to be dropping him in. Okay, big shout out at 40s, but dropped in, running style key. Um, Tony, let's come back to you and cover a bit more of the Irish action. You were taken with a couple of bumper performances from the last seven days or so. Which ones jumped out the page at you? Yeah, it was the two winners on the weekend um, were both impressive. Uh, Goran, first of all, the, the Jiggenstown mare, the, the four-year-old, was very impressive, well fancied in the market, very well bred. I think she's a, she half the mighty potter on French Dynamite and a few days cost a lot of money. Um, without having run. I, I wouldn't be expecting her to be a, a punch or a Cheltenham champion bumper horse. I, I expect they might keep her at home, but, but she was very good on um, Saturday, but more so thinking of the champion bumper at Cheltenham, this horse of Willie Mullins, Ballybourne, um, Ronnie Bartlett owned horse. I thought he was impressive now. Uh, did plenty wrong, was keen in the early stages, but as a real genuine low head carriage, and then turning into the straight, it just looks like he, he, he's beaten, he hasn't a hope, but he just seems to find another bit. And then he finishes up and very strong at the line, wins going away. To me, it looked like, like a strong bumper. Um, you had the front, the first three home were all very solid in the market. Gordon Elliott's horse attracted kind of late support. The third was Irish Panther, who'd given fact to file a, a tough race at um, Leperstown at Christmas. Even the fourth horse, the uh, Pat Fahey horse, cost uh, quite a few quid out of a pint as well. So I wouldn't be one bit surprised now if um, he's a player on the champion bumper. Ch James's gate um, won the same race last year. I know it's a tight window, but Willie Munns can get the improvement out of them better than most. And just more generally on the on the champion bumper, I'm just thinking a bit more about that race in the last week or two. I'm thinking maybe that the favourite, the, it's for me, the Munir and Swede horse. He, he looks very short now at the minute um, for what he's done. Yes, he beat Sutton's Hill. I wouldn't be surprised if Sutton's Hill was a better horse than Nace afterwards. He, he didn't get the best ride. I'm sure, I don't think in, in Navin, the lad that was riding him got jocked off afterwards. Um, but just it, even just from the Irish horses, it feels like a race where it, it's 10 deep uh, at least. Like Willie Mullins has, has five or six horses that you, you'd kind of be given chances of hitting the frame anyway. You have John Cayley's horse. Uh, Gordon Elliott has a couple of a couple of interesting ones there, Pura Field and the horse that won it down Royal. I think no time to wait. He's talking about running him too. So uh, he's three and a half to one at the minute. That looks short in, in an open year. It, it's not a it's not a year we're settling down to be, you know, Enva Elan versus uh, Blue Sari or um Sir Gerhard versus Kukrit, which it's kind of just basically a, a Tet a tet. This looks wide open. I haven't even mentioned the English horse who, who don't know an awful lot about. Like even their John McConnell's horse went over to England. Canto Bruno would have been impressive. Would, would have upside. So definitely a, a race to be poking about. I've had a couple of small bets on horses on, at mad prices on the exchange, and this I backed them. Um, backed Henry. The, the, the tiny, tiny bets, but pushing for treble figure prices. I backed there. Uh, what's he called? Slade Steel, uh, belonging to the Bromhead and Rob Court. He 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 won nicely enough in punch time. They're talking about him as a champion bumper horse. Back that pearl of fee as well. Back that other one I'm talking about, the horse that won down Royal, no time to wait. So just just taking a chance. I think on the day I'd be keen to take on the, the favourite anyway. Okay, Tony Keane to take on the favourite. Ballyburn has been price boosted by Boyle Sports to 9-1 to one for the champion bumper. So if you are taken with Tony's comments, then please avail of that price boost. Um, let's move on and stick with you, Tony, because um, Hidden Valley Lake disappointed a little bit at the weekend, beaten by stablemate Monty Starr. I know he's giving weight away, but um, sort of shakes up the Albert Bartlett market even more, I suppose. Yeah, it does again. Not the easiest race to get to get a grasp on because they did seem to go um very steadily, and then I suppose that the the clash that we thought we were getting with Corbett's Cross didn't materialize. Hidden Valley Lake, I suppose, the most disappointing aspect of his performance was his jumping. Um, kind of fell asunder a little bit late, made a bad mistake three out. He wasn't great two out either. Um, but the stable mate was impressive, impressive in kind of everything he did. The way he travelled, the fact that he was coming off um. Just one run in the maiden hurdle. He had shaped very well. He'd shaped second best in the Shan Valley kid. But he just took a massive jump from first to second start. And he looks a really big scope. He was actually bigger than Hidden, Hidden Valley Lake. He's a, 
he's related to Manel Indo and, and that so he might take another jump forward for Cheltenham so it's kind of not just show sure what to make of this race because it was a steadily run I, I do think Hidden Valley didn't seem to really enjoy the Clonmel track like especially not torn and in he, he was kind of on his head a little bit um, but at the same time I wouldn't be surprised if the winner progressed again such as the improvement he got for just a second start Okay, well, Monty Star is 12 to 1 with Ball Sports for the Albert Bartlett. Um, competition time, guys. We have a competition for you. First time, I think, this season. Um, viewers, please do scan the on screen QR code that you can see right now because then you'll have a chance of winning an amazing prize to the Cheltenham Gold Cup via the At the Races Express, which is the steam train that takes you right in to Cheltenham Racecourse, then you walk through the car park and bang, you're on the track. It's a great way to arrive at the races. You miss all the traffic and um, it's a nice experience. You get great views of the Cotswolds on your way into Gold Cup Day. What more could you want? So scan the QR code to be in with a chance of winning that fabulous prize. Uh, as Tony said, up at the start of the show, we had some excellent questions. Thank you so much for sending so many of them in. It is now time to answer some of those questions. Only the best ones made the cut, but we are gonna start by going straight over to Tony because Tony you have your own question you'd like to pose to one of us Barry in fact but uh, take it away please it's question time yeah I'm not uh, I'm not sure if the best one's made the cut it's more an observation and I was interested in Barry's thoughts and I thought it was a very interesting article on the Racing Post yesterday Lewis Porteous I hope I'm pronouncing that correct Lewis um, but just an interesting piece long piece uh, about um, pre-trainers and things like that and I, I, I thought he explained it very well it just seems to be a structural change in the way the game is kind of operating now you've got these massive yards both in England and Ireland and I suppose they really need a, a kind of a feeder system into them um, where we lads are pre-trained horses getting them fit younger horses are, horses needing time off and all that type of stuff and you wonder is this kind of a I suppose a trickle down economics in, into in, into the the, the money that's been spent on horses is now trickling down to these kind of um, feeder trainers, as I'm saying. And maybe perspective, people who maybe might like to train themselves are, are taking kind of a conscious business decision and saying, do you know what, Like it's very, very tough taking on these big lads. Um, maybe a safer kind of income might be this, this pre-train. Like I also have a theory, and Barry may shoot me down completely in this, uh, people may seem totally mad. I have a theory like that, you have the top 10 jumps trainers in Ireland, Okay, like walking from Willie Mullins down there through to Elliot Mead, Joseph O'Brien, Henry Bromwell, blah, 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 so on and so forth, Gavin Cromwell. And I just wonder, are like the 11th, 12th, 13th, 14th, 15th best trainers in Ireland, not trainers for the track at all, are the point-to-point -point trainers? Because they've kind of said, like, why would I bother trying to train somewhere between 15 and 20 winners a year and be scrabbling around for a bit of a living? And instead, I'm just going to try and train these pointers that are just like... Um, tulips and that Dutch history thing they're just you know paying mad money for them the likes of the the dials there Moonbeck Stables and Colin Bow and Pat Dial and Elmery Holden there to a degree they're just saying now if we get a lovely squeeze out of these ones going at two and three hundred thousand get them ready for the point and um, that might be a safer living than taking on these lads and you know your horse running the screamer and, and finishing fourth to two Willie Mullins and a Gordon Elliott but Barry is kind of somewhat in this game may have a, a totally different take on this but that I just thought it was an interesting piece and well worth reading yeah no, it was an interesting piece but I suppose there's a few different angles um, firstly you know you have certain uh, yards where they are pre-training you know it might necessarily suit the person who has that yard to take on the responsibility and the role of actually training, you know, trying to chase up money from owners, you know, the pressure involved, that could be one reason. And um, you read Ben Dahano, he says he likes to see the horses, albeit he had the hand in his license, but now he's pre training, he likes to see those horses progress. But you know, if you are, if you were a person, if you are Willie Mullins or if you're Gordon Elliott, I don't think you'd enjoy sitting and watching on. So, you know, if you have that level of ambition and you don't want to be watching someone else to train it you're going to do it yourself so you're going to push yourself so you know Gordon and Gavin Cromwell for example 22 years ago we shared a, a, a motel room in America during foot and mouth Gordon was an amateur and Gavin was a, a farrier and they're now Cheltenham Festival you know numerous Cheltenham Festival winning trainers so you know it, it's there for you if you are up for it but it's it's a you know it's it, it's a big sacrifice and it probably doesn't suit everyone. The level of commitment involved, even you see it still with Nicky Henderson. You saw what it meant Shishkin on Saturday. You know his he's he's up every morning five o'clock during the Chelt during the build up towards Cheltenham. You know the bedroom light is on. He never sleeps because the the clock is constantly ticking, and that's not for everyone. 
Um, so I think there is more to it. Um, I, re- I respect what you say as regards to a lot of these top yards, but they are the top yards too for a reason. And, you know, as I said, Gavin Gordon, you look at Ben Pauling. I know Dan Skelton probably walked into some great facilities, but he's made it work and he's got the results. So I think it's, it's a results-based business. And if you're not getting the results, you're not in business. Fair, fair. Okay, well, let's move on to some of our viewers' questions, viewers and listeners out there, listeners on the podcast platform. Um, A lot of Cheltenham-centric questions, as you would expect, with only three weeks to go until the big day, uh, well, the big week. We will kick off, Barry. This question can come your way and then my way. Three horses you're most looking forward to backing at the Cheltenham Festival. Uh, Take it away, please, Barry. Three horses from you. Yeah, well, I like Lucia. Um, very impressive in her two novice hurdles. Are very impressive in her bumpers last year. I think she's going to be hard to beat in the mare's novice hurdle. Um, you saw how, how keen it was in Shishkin last weekend, so my view wouldn't have changed there as well. And then one slightly left field. Um, I'm looking forward to seeing Sir Gerhard and hope when he lines up in the Brown Advisory. Um, very, very classy horse. I think he'd be better suited up on trip. He might, he'd find his jumping easier. So he'd be one I'd look forward to if he lines up in the Brown Advisory. Okay, and the three favourites, well, yeah, favourites that I am I definitely won't be taking on and looking forward to backing myself are El Fabiolo in the Arkle, a pretty obvious one, Mighty Potter in the Turners, equally obvious, and Blazing Carl in the Stairs after what he did recently on his comeback appearance. So those are my three. Um, but then the same question, Barry, comes back to you about three horses you're most looking forward to taking on at the Cheltenham Festival, please. I think Allegory de Vassi, um, she's a very, very good mare and she's a you know, she's really classy, but um her jumping leaves a little bit to, to be desired. Um she's only had two runs, I think, taking on some experienced rivals, she might just struggle. So I think she's worth taking on in the, the Mrs. Paddy Power chase. Uh others are Herbis Allen, I think very competitive Ballymore. He is a good horse, but he hasn't had to beat the horses with the with the potential that are lining up here. Gaelic Warrior, Good Land, um in the pocket there's, there's a there's five six seven here with lots of chances and um, so i think he's worth taking on and the same for it's for me it's just as tony mentioned early on the depth in the bumper there's so many there with chances oh, and yeah. um, so i'd put the two of those in the one bracket these are quality races um and there's a good bit of winning in them so i think they'd be two that i just would take on in such competitive races yeah, and I concur your thoughts. My two, I've got Allegor de Vassi. I'm also very keen to take on the Mare's Chase and Gallopin de Champs controversially in the Gold Cup. Uh, I want to take him on as well. So those were my two. Um, Tony, we can move on to Ryan Garrett's question, which is very interesting, essentially in regards to the Irish novice hurdlers this year and compare, comparing them to the British. But Ryan Garrett has asked, what do you think of the Irish novice hurdle form? Tamaris at 16 has a similar profile to some of the Boy, great chance. Um, we got loads of Cheltenham novice hurdle uh, hurdle questions, but that was the one that we take took away as a sort of more general one in regards to that Irish form, Tony. Yeah, we got a few questions there. People asking about Ilete Tomp and high definition and their chances in the Supreme as well. Just to run through, through the Supreme, so we've got the erstwhile favourite there, Fasil Vega, complete flop the last day. Now the second favourite is the horse that ran as a pacemaker for him beforehand. The the third the third favourite hasn't run since early December. Um, trained by a man that has never trained the Cheltenham Festival winner. Um, you've got Tamir's taller t- hurdle would have a Midland record. Uh, producing a, a supreme winner. Then you've uh, Hunter's yarn. He can't jump. You've Deverge just coming out of a, a mid order. No. I'll just stop there because I'm doing that intentionally to pick the worst trait of every horse that's in the front of the market in the supreme. And but that's the kind of race that it is. Um, so. I'm not going to talk down anyone for fa- and for fancying a horse at a price here because I feel this is it's not a supreme whether it's a Fatur or a Duvan or an Alti or a, heaven forbid a Constitution Hill. It feels like a Somerville boy or a Le Bake or an Abazayan type of year, and um, you're not going to it's not going to take the one sixty horse to win it. The one fifty horse might be enough to win it, and that's my one opinion on the supreme at the at the moment. That and maybe I was a bit harsh on the likes of Iletia Tomp. Um, and maybe high definition will for once be able to get away with his jumping. So I can't really put anyone off anything because it's that type of race. It's so wide open, there's nothing solid in it. So maybe wait for the day, wait for the extra places um, and take a chance on something. Um, because uh, to me, every horse in it has a wart or more than one wart. 
Okay, Barry, so same question to you and reflections on what Tony's just said there in regards to um, those Irish novice form angles. Yeah, no, I'd agree with a lot of what Tony says, but going back to the question, Tamaris um, put up a good performance uh, when winning the Tallerwork, but Harry, Harry Cobden's reaction afterwards, he thought he'd make, make the first four in the Supreme, so that wasn't going to fill you with confidence. And then Paul Nichols, uh, highlighted maybe a race in Kelso which would have been the more battle as his option so I don't think either of those comments would fill you with confidence um, obviously the Noel Feely Syndicate were keen to go to Cheltenham so he's going to go to Cheltenham he has a chance but I don't think uh, the jockey or trainer would, would, would just uh, fill you with confidence as I say Okay um, Tony back to you for Birdman's question uh, is Embassy Gardens the Irish banker for the Albert Bartlett given your comments on this show in regards to this race I think I know your answer but take it away please Tony No <laughs> No okay we'll keep that is that any, any more to add no I don't think we need to add any more do we Just revert to my previous comments about this horse yeah, fair enough. Refer to those. Um, Barry, we'll come to you for Ben's question here. Uh, ben has asked, Edward Stone, an and editor to cheat. Who would you like for the champion chase and why? Um, I, I would go with um, an Ergamine, slightly over Edward Stone. I think the track would have suited Edward to get the last day in Cheltenham on the new course, stiffer track, stamp, more of a stamina test. Uh, but an interesting comment from Willie Mullins in his stable tour how we mentioned that an Ergamine would have needed the run in the Clarence House. So he was keen, he seemed very fresh, didn't see it out as well. So I would slightly have an Ergamine ahead of Edward Stone. Okay, and I would be on Team Edward Stone's side for the Alan King operation. I'm sticking with him, Ben. Um, Tony, we're coming to you for the next question. Kevin has asked, lots of people have backed Chapeau de Solil, is it? For the champion bumper, what does he need to do to get in? I would say he's iffy enough now to get in. Um, I'm not 100% certain of this, but I'm pretty sure the qualification for this is done on the handicappers official ratings for bumper horses. Now, they, there aren't those aren't available yet. They'll only be done, I think, at, at the five-day entry stage uh, for the champion bumper. Um, and as we both kind of mentioned already, that the, the bumper is a very deep race this year. There's lots of winners there. There's some that have won more than one race. And this uh, Ricci or Chapeau de Soleil or Chapeau de Soleil has only finished second in a fairy house bumper where the winner hasn't run yet and the ones in behind there are only three of them have run um quite moderate races afterwards so he to me will be one that may struggle to get a mark that will actually qualify him to run you would think that there might be what is it, 22 max field for this that there could easily be that number uh, rated higher than him Okay, uh, yeah, I'm reliably informed by our producer that it's Soleil, Chapeau du Soleil. I had to drop French uh, at about the age of seven, so it's, it's, not, my, it's not my remit, these French names. Uh, Tony, let's move on to you. Let's stick with you, sorry, for Jordan's question. Jordan has asked, if you were to have three best bets anti-post for the handicaps, what would they be and why, please, Tony? Yeah, horrible question, Jordan. Thanks a million for that. Um, there was another fella. There, there was another fella asked the question: When, when would I start going looking at handicaps? And I'd kind of tritely say, and been largely honest, I, I wouldn't look at them till two days before till I got the final fields. I, I'm gone very um, late with doing these handicaps. Look, if something jumps out at me and says I think that's really well handicapped and I think the price is going to go, uh, I'd be quite inclined to take it. But the overruns in these races at, at the minute. Are, are, are totally kind of ridiculous and I, I just wouldn't have the interest in putting the time into go solving them like there's great glory in fits of geez i backed a county hurdle winner you know in the, on the 25th of february brilliant but i just wonder about the time cost like i just be looking at it there's, there's loads of irish meetings between now and then there's loads of interesting irish meetings between now and then and I, i'd kind of be focusing my attention on those the Cheltenham handicaps can kind of wait um the other thing again this is just this is totally personal to me and everyone will have their own way of doing things and open mind to what other people are just trying to do what, what suits me i would probably be more interested in doing handicap hurdles and handicap chases and there's one very simple reason for that the irish horses have a better record in the handicap hurdles and i don't know the english horses i certainly don't know the english handicappers um i'd have to do a lot of looking and a lot of reading to, to get up to speed but say something like the ultima where there might only be three irish runners like that'd be a race to be minimal bet race for me um where something like a, a Coral Cup now or a County Hurdle or Martin Pipe, like I, I'd love going through those because I know the Irish horses, hopefully know 
the new and stuff, them maybe the one that's been waiting for back the ground, the one that was in the wrong part of the track, things like that. But sorry, it's a little bit boring to say, and I know people love to picking out handicap horses at this point. Um, I don't really. I've one or two horses in mind. Like they're not even in the betting for the races that I think they're they're possible for. So I don't know if that a good thing or a bad thing. We'll find out when the entries come out. Um, this week, but I'm kind of quite happy to wait, and there'll be plenty of you know decent prices there still on the day. I love it. The thing is about your answer there, Tony, is you've left it basically the door open for all the viewers and listeners to stay tuned in the build up to Cheltenham because you're not giving anything away yet. And we will be with everyone for four days of the Cheltenham Festival. And so if you want Tony's tips for the handicaps, you'll have to tune in the night before essentially to get them. Um, Tony, let's stick with you because we have another excellent question from Darren. Uh, with many a preview night coming up in the next few weeks, who and what are actually worth listening to? Well, well, this one obviously Darren for starters but Tony any others any any people in particular <laughs> another dirty question from Darren here and I've really been dropped in it here like, look I'm not going to crap on anyone here like I have people who I like listening to people who like I kind of find I never agree with and I'm sure there's loads of people at home saying listen that fella hasn't a clue either and, and that's totally fine look like that's people have their own way of doing this what I like and what I don't like, I, I don't like this talk about, oh, that's a certainty and this is a certainty and that, that there's no hope and all that. That just wouldn't be my way of doing things. Um, I don't tend to think like that. Fair to take maybe people talking about probabilities, that, that's a big price, that's going to shorten, whatever, whatever um, the case may be. Now, I know a lot of that is, is, is totally boring um, to a lot of people and the certainty stuff is, is real interesting and, and a bit of fun and all that. And, and fun is part of it too. Like It's not all lads with kind of spreadsheets adding up to 100% over around like that that'll bore you to tears at a Cheltenham preview like here here let's let's project my spreadsheet up on the screen like talk about turning off 90% of the crowd like um but with with the three I, I I do think the trainers the, the trainers now can say some very boring stuff and very vanilla stuff in the lead up to Cheltenham and I totally understand it they don't, they don't want stuff rubbed in their face after the meeting. They've been interviewed every day, every second day, maybe twice or three times a day. But it's when they say something that's a bit weird or tell me something I don't know type of thing or, oh God, I didn't know that. So that was the reason for that. Uh, my, my ears would tend to prick up with that and pay a bit of attention to that. Um, now, Gordon Elliott would be a, a person who, who, who I think is good at that. He, he kind of gives a little bit away. Like, for instance, he, he'd a stable here on the racing post, I think, on... Yeah, Monday, yesterday for people listening on Tuesday. Um, he said three or four things that I thought were, were quite interesting. I, I definitely didn't know. I just mentioned them quickly here. Like, um, Hollow Games is a breeding operation since the last day. Uh, interesting. Riviera tells it some sort of back surgery. She was jumping rotten now this season, so maybe that straightened her out. Uh, the boss has also got some sort of sinus issue. Um, again, that may explain running bad form, come back to form a bit the last day. And Zana here has kind of had a, a stifle issue as well. Um, and he's also doubling down on the fact that he thought Liberty Dance got a bad raid at the Dublin Racing Festival. He obviously thinks that that horse gave him too much to do. He said that a couple of times now. They were all things I didn't know before that, that that's what he thought. Now, I'm not saying necessarily I'm fancying any of those five horses. But if you were fancying them, um, they would certainly be things that would encourage. And that's the type of thing I'd be looking out for rather than the obvious, oh, well, you know, this horse is going well at home. Something that there, well, there are excuses maybe for bad runs. Because there will be horses that will come bounce back to form at Cheltenham and it's nice to know beforehand what the reason might be. Okay, Darren, I hope that has answered your question emphatically. Um, Barry, a, a final question for you, our last one that we have put in the running order. LFC Shane has asked, is it realistic to expect Brandy Love to run on Wednesday, that's at Punchestown, and then run in the Mayor's race three weeks later? Surely too small a gap between races. Yeah, it's it's unusual for Willie um to rush him back like that, but he's he must be very keen to get a run in, and I suppose maybe it's got to do with jumping, um and I suppose he he'll hope he she'll get as easy a time as possible. Queen's Brook is in there, and she definitely won't give him give her an easy time. So it'll be interesting to see, but it wouldn't be true to Willie's form. So he he's obviously very keen to get a run in. Okay, fair enough. Um. Next week on the show, we're going to be looking at a few darker horses, apparently. We'll have to get our thinking caps on, but that's what my producer reliably informs me again. Um, so do stay tuned to that, and we'll obviously have handicap entries too. But in the meantime, thank you so much for your questions, viewers. Uh, we much appreciate it. They came on all different sources, um, but thank you very much for getting involved in the show. It makes for interesting content, and that's what we're here for. Uh, quick look at the week ahead. Obviously, we are recording this on Monday night. We've got Kempton to look forward to.
On Saturday, we have the Adonis Hurdle there and the Coral Trophy Handicap Chase. It looks like we might see Frodon in that and also Nuzra and Scriptwright have entries in the Adonis Hurdle. Um, Barry, of the early entries, what caught your eye at this stage at Kempton? I'm very sweet in Frodon. Uh, he won the Badger Rails last season, or at the start of the season, sorry, good ground, win Canton, sharp track. Likewise in Kempton, drying ground, sharp track, flat track, 18 lengths behind Braveman's game, but back down to a mark that's only £3 higher than that uh, when he won, won in Win Canton, won the Badger Rails. So I think he's really interesting, albeit he has top weight. Right, that about wraps up the show, everyone. Thank you very much, as always, for watching and listening. Thank you to Barry and Tony for their contributions. And do join us again next week, where we will be looking back at the weekend that has just gone, but we'll also, as I said before, be looking at those dark horses for the Cheltenham Festival. And it will be our penultimate episode ahead of Cheltenham Week. So it's mad how time is flying. But as always, like I said, thank you very much for watching. For your contributions, for your questions, please do get in contact with us with any feedback give us a like give us a retweet hit subscribe you know the drill by now but for now that was off the fence brought to you in association with ball sports <laughs> <laughs>